apologies for today or substitutions from any of the groups. The only apology I've received so far could have been from Councillor Wilson and no substitutions. Is there any other apologies from the body? No. Agenda number one, as always, is declaration of interest in terms of ethical standards. Does anybody have anything to declare? Agenda no. number two is the Digital NL Year 3 Service Design Programme, and Katrina is going to take us through this. Thank you, Convener. Afternoon, everybody. So, so this report's got two key aims. The, the first is to advise on delivery of the year two, year two programme that was approved by committee last May, um, and the second is to seek approval for the year three activity. So, uh, turning first to the year two update, um, starting at paragraph 2.1, um, you can see that the year two programme had 17 separate work packages, um, and that was further broken down into 62 discrete activities. Um, paragraph 2.2, um, and Table 1 highlights the, the progress um, and the impact that, that COVID had on, on delivery of that. You can see 94% um, of, of activities were complete or, or ongoing. Um, the status code, I'll just really explain that a little bit, although it is detailed in the appendix. So, um, planned activity to complete. So, status code PAC simply means that it was planned activity to complete, um, and 24 of those at 39%. Um, moving further down then to like COVID impacts um, completed, so COVID impact completed. So there's there's a rationale there to the code, and hopefully that helps in, in identifying those that we had planned as approved, and then those that were brought on later on um, as part of COVID changes. Um, so paragraphs 2.4 and 2.5 detail the alternative activities that were actually undertaken um, throughout the year and, and committee will be fairly familiar with the content there and we've been updating on any changes to the programme at, at each committee cycle. So hopefully that's um, fairly clear. But um, jumping to year three then in paragraph 2.7 onwards. So table two and appendix two highlight it's going to be a really busy year um, for us and for the council. Um, as we're trying to complete the activities that were delayed from last year, also try and manage um, the system issues that we know that we're going to have to work through um, that were relating to the former culture leisure North Lanarkshire insourcing um, and trying to progress redesign of an additional 14 areas across the council, but, but really just trying to make up that lost time from, from last year. Um, you can see further down in the report, so it's a bit slow for me today, um, paragraph 2.10 and 2.11. So we're, we're put some detail in on what we think year four might look like, but obviously that's subject to really good progress against the, the year three is there for your consideration today. All going to plan, then we would hope to conclude all the redesign activity of all the council functions by March 2023. But we would bring an update report on progress against the programme every cycle, and, and we'll obviously um, monitor that um, and provide any information as we go forward. And I'm just happy to take any questions, convener. Thanks, Katrina. Do you have any comments or questions in regards to this report? Councillor Barclay. Thanks. Um, thanks, convener. It wouldn't be a, com a time of year for without me having a comment on it, as you've said before. Um, you know, that is great, Katrina. Can I just um, query, see at um, Appendix 2, uh, at the end, it's about the the FTE savings. The the anticipated savings in June um, of 2018 were 671.9, but now it's um, reduced, which to me is a good thing to five eight four point two. Is there a specific reason for that? And also has have, have the, the unions been involved in the discussion over the the reduction of the, the, the FT being identified? Thanks, Katrina. Yeah, a very specific reason, Councillor Barclay. So when the, the original business case that was approved came to council, it was based on our establishments in 2018. So so that's that's quite some time ago. Um, so we did a rebaseline at the beginning of this year to look at what the establishments are now. 
Um, and there's obviously been, um, restructures across the council for, for we aspire um, to get them into that structure, but also then um, significant budget savings in, in the services over the piece as well. So it's largely that reduction of what those establishments look like just now. So, so we have that at a high level, um, I guess, the, uh, in council services at the moment. Have taken that through the, the engagement that we have with the digital NL trade unions um, and other trade union meetings as well. But what we do is um, as we start to work in a sprint, um, which the unions are involved in at that point as well, then we look at what that might actually be in reality. So those are still what we consider to be the maximum savings based on the, the, the view of how we could use technology um, that was outlined in the business case at the time. But every time we start working through that, then we apply that that realistic view of what does it really mean for North Lanarkshire now. So yeah, hopefully um, the unions are, are um, on board with, with that process. We certainly have regular dialogue on it. Could I have a supplementary? Yep, um, thanks, Katrina. Is there kind of specific reasons of it? Is it is it because uh, is it a kind of a good news story about redeployment about the the sort of realising you need people or um, is it because of COVID related or you know is there anything with that kind of um, of why the figure has changed just obviously is, it, is that figure going to be fluid going forward? Sorry it seems to take me ages to get off mute today um, I would say it absolutely is going to be fluid and rightly so, you know, we, as we're working through it. And that's why it's good to have that regular update here as we're going forward. Really, Councillor Barclay, it's just the movement in the establishments at this stage. So it's been looking at the establishments back then to the establishments as they are now um, and the posts that came out of that activity analysis at the time. So um, it's it's not really down to um, re redeployments. It could be, of course, when we get into the detail, it might be that people have moved from one function to another or, or they're in different posts where there's, there's less automation, perhaps, and there might have been in previous roles. But it'll be fluid, um, and yeah, I'm really keen um, that we. That's why I wanted the figures in for this particular report that we actually do monitor that um, as, as we're working through and giving you updates at each cycle. Thank Thanks, you, Tina. Thanks, Councillor Barclay. Don't see anybody else intimated, so I take it we can agree to the recommendations on page five. Convener John Watson here, Unison. Can I have? Sorry, John. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask Katrina uh, a couple of questions, or three questions actually? But firstly, um, we haven't really been involved in any discussions that I know of with regards to the reduction uh, of uh, full-time posts or equivalent posts. Um, so it's went from 650, the initial document, and now, which I think you indicated um, that that was more or less the Price Waterhouse Coopers document, or I think it was them. Now you say it's your revised document, so it's the ownership of yourselves. Um, I would just like to know one: how did you? What algorithm did was used to to calculate how many jobs at the five hundred and eighty that may be affected? You call them savings, and I'll call them cuts. When did you plan to discuss the actual figure with the trade unions? Because speaking to my colleague Marie Murphy, uh, who's the branch secretary, she's not had any discussions with you about with regards to the jobs. And thirdly, uh, department-wise, have you informed the managed, senior management team in these departments or whatever departments that you use now think that you can take these savings or cuts from? Thank you. John, John. So how we got about those figures, so there was, there was detailed analysis through activity analysis across the council back throughout 2018. Um, that analysis was undertaken um, by PwC. They then used their their judgment of having worked with other councillors of, of councils of similar size, um, and what our processes looked like at that point compared to what they could look like um, with the digital technologies that we were hoping to deploy. And bearing in mind that when we did the business case, we didn't know exactly which technologies we might actually deploy, but we we had an idea it would be more um, cloud hosted office 365 that kind of thing so we're not far away um, from from where we're moving to based on where we thought we were moving to 
Um, not an algorithm as such. It's, it looks at every single process of what what happens in the council and what could happen, and then the complexity of that automation. So the the FTE implications are then based on whether it's easy to make the change, difficult to make the change, or more complex. So there, there is a whole host of information go, goes behind that. Um, uh, and we, we did um, have um, various meetings in the run up to the business case getting approved and since where we talked through that um, and highlighted what it would look like for each of the services. So the reductions, the numbers that are there just now are still based on those assumptions of high, medium and low complexity um, and what it might look like now based on the establishments that we have in the structures. Um, we have advised the unions of that, but but where we get into the detailed um, conversations, John um, and and um, committee, is when we start those service sprints. So we can only use the waste one really at the moment as as an example that everyone's familiar with. So um, and we brought a detailed um, framework on that to committee. I think it was last year, possibly September, but I can't remember. But that will certainly be coming forward in every cycle now that we've got this detail in there. So for waste, I can't remember the exact numbers, but see when PwC did the, the activity analysis for us, it was identified that maybe 20 FTEs could, could be impacted if we move from the processes that waste had to the processes they should well have when it's much more automated and more self-service. Um, then when we started the waste sprint, we looked at the reality of what was the establishment and, and what those processes could be. Um, and it, came, it actually came in marginally higher. I think it came in about 24 or 25 FTE. Um, unions were involved at that point as that was us then starting to think about the actual implications for posts as well as services. Um, and then ultimately unions were involved in helping with that reshaping. You know, we've already said that it was it was the first um, for us um, looking at the complexity of that and that there were things absolutely in that redesign that could have gone better. Uh, and we've already committed to lessons learned, brought a lessons learned um, paper back through the, the trade union meeting, possibly the last one, um, but we certainly talked about it at, at the previous one before of all of the changes that we're actually going to make to ensure that we get better dialogue um, and actually are thinking ahead. So um, I'm trying to think if I've picked up on all of your points, John, but if I've missed anything, please just come back and let me know and I'll, I'll respond. Yes, thanks for that, um, Katrina. Katrina, I think given the concerns, that the, and I'm, I think I'll speak for all the joint trades in this, I think given the concerns we have with the vast numbers, because that's a colossal amount of numbers, colossal amount of jobs and the impact that will have on our members and in the community. I think we should have uh, a meeting uh, as soon as possible um, with um, the joint trades and yourselves to look. You've obviously got a paper. You obviously know roughly the departments you're looking to target, um, i.e. because this really concerns us. Uh, and I think we should have a specific meeting that addresses these issues or starts to address the issues so that we in the trade union movement can start to uh, inform our membership. Thank you. Well, I think Katrina certainly not nodding away to that as well, and you know I think certainly will get picked up after the meeting. And you know obviously the, uh, in terms of taking something through down the JCC route as well to get a wider discussion, perhaps could be appropriate as well. So we'll take that up certainly after this. Uh, but thanks for raising it. Thanks, Katrina. Can I just come in on one final point? Yeah. Sorry, Katrina, because I didn't respond on your final question, John, and you've just reminded me of that. So we've gone through that that rebaselining and got those indicative FTE numbers for each service area. We um, actually are just starting to have more regular dialogue with the management teams around what those numbers are. We forgot to acknowledge that it was a couple of years ago. Um, we did not have an activity analysis for education and families at the time. And, and with the change that's actually happened across the council over the last year, then absolutely are looking as we're working in the, the, the sprints with like health and social care, where there are big numbers, and we want to redo that activity analysis. So we'll get that work just um, underway at the moment um, to more firm up on those numbers. But I totally agree with you, John, that we're at the point where we really need to be starting to get into the dialogue on that. So happy to take that forward. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Katrina. So we can agree to the recommendations on page five. Agenda number three, the community benefits update, Jennifer. 
Thank you, convener. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the third of the six monthly tracking reports that comes to this committee and provides members with oversight of the community benefits that are being delivered by Agilisys and PwC, our digital business partners. And previous reports to committee have noted that progress in delivering the community benefits wasn't as um, the business partners would have envisaged because due to the pandemic, they weren't able to go into schools or meet with community groups and offer digital learning opportunities. They weren't able to take um, student placements and provide learning opportunities for students and graduates from New College Lanarkshire and the University of the West of Scotland in particular. But notwithstanding the constraints of COVID, there is still a contractual responsibility on our digital partners to deliver these community benefits. And equally, there's a responsibility on the Council to ensure that the community benefits are being delivered and our business partners are delivering additionality, improved outcomes and um, opportunities for residents across North Lanarkshire. I'm pleased to report, convener, that um, we have seen progress over the past six months with both companies adapting their offering and developing workarounds to deliver community benefits remotely. And um, sections 24 to 25 of the report on pages 21 to 23 describe some of the projects that we're now rolling out. And I would like to highlight a couple of these, if I may. Um, in October last year, PwC met with the Developing Young Workforce Lead Officers from our high schools and introduced them to the New Skills, New World modules that are available on PwC's website and encouraged the teaching staff to look to use these modules and integrate them within their personal and social development offering. Three high schools took up the offer, St Margaret's, Green Falls and Braidhurst, and we've received feedback directly from Braidhurst, who said how much the pupils enjoyed the sessions, and the DYW lead officer, Matthew Clark in Braidhurst, has also offered feedback to PwC on how the modules could be improved in the future. Building on that, PwC have also worked directly with Mr Clark and um, Mr Stevenson from Brannock High School to look at developing a series of four modules for young people really aimed at S4 to S6 and beginning to introduce the young people to getting out into the world of work, the skills and attributes that will be required to have. We originally anticipated that these modules would be delivered live directly with pupils from Braithurst and Brannock. But with the continuing COVID lockdown after Christmas, that wasn't possible. And PWC had to develop them as a series of four recorded sessions. The benefit of that is that the Council now has these four recorded sessions and we can use them in the future across all our high schools. Both um, Braidhurst and Brannock are planning to use the modules immediately after the current assessment phase is finished, with Braidhurst using them with a class of S5 pupils and um, Brannock going to use them with a class uh, with S6 pupils. Picking up on the request from committee at the last meeting, we have designed a feedback forum for the young people themselves who are taking part in the modules to feedback what they liked, what they didn't like, what they learned. And I would hope to be able to include the results from that feedback in the next report to committee in November. Moving on to Agilisys, we are seeing good progress with Agilisys and the programme director is now directly involved and taking a personal interest in the community benefits. I mentioned previously that the company has bought 200 training licences from a company called Avado and the training is a series of six modules looking at data analytics. Um, looking at performance, looking at trends, looking at data. What does it tell you? What's it not telling you? And we are in the process of going out 
through Business Gateway and through the Council's website and social media channels to advertise these modules and to promote them among small to medium sized enterprises across North Lanarkshire, because they will be really useful to companies in helping them to analyse their performance figures or sales figures or customer satisfaction rates. We're also going to use some of the modules with our larger, more strategic community and voluntary organisations, the ones that offer um, services directly, because again, the modules would help these organisations with things like preparing a business plan, submitting an annual report, or preparing a major funding application to something like the lottery. And we're going to keep some of the licences back for targeted young people um, who are coming through routes to work, for example, or members of the Scottish Youth Parliament, because there are a lot of little tricks and techniques in the modules that will be useful to young people, and there will be opportunities for them to transfer the skills that they've learned into other settings. Agilisys have also made um, around 100 of their own internal courses available to the Council, and these have now been uploaded to our Learn NL platform. And the generic courses such as customer care or dealing with stress, we are discussing with libraries whether we can also make these available through the library's learning management system, which means that local individuals and community representatives could um, participate in these learning modules. At the last meeting, we emphasised the importance of effective monitoring, and we now have this six monthly report through this committee. We also have regular updates to the Digital NL Projects Board and also um, through the Digital Skills and Inclusion Group, which is a there's a report from the Digital Skills and Inclusion Group on this agenda. In terms of the financial impact received to date from the community benefits, this is summarised in um, section four of the report on page 24. But the recordings that I mentioned PWC have developed have an estimated investment value of £10,500, and that's linked to the PWC staff time in recording the modules, in sourcing the materials, and in designing the courses. And with Agilisys, the value of the community benefits received to date, and that's a combination of investment value and actual costs through purchasing the 200 licences, for example, is £172,500. So, as I said at the outset, we are beginning to see good progress here. The Digital Skills Inclusion Group and the communities team will continue to work closely with Agilisys in particular to identify further opportunities for new community benefits. Our capacity to um, secure further community benefits through PwC at this point in time is limited because the company has a negligible portfolio of call-off contracts under the framework agreement, but we are due to get some mental health first aid training from PwC in the summer and that will be delivered in partnership with NHS Lanarkshire. In terms of risk management, very briefly, the monitoring in place by this committee and the enhanced monitoring through the Digital um, Skills and Inclusion Group and the Projects Board ensures and minimises the risk that we are failing to secure um, community benefits at a level commensurate with the contract awards for both PwC and Agilisys. Happy to take any questions, convener and members. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. So, London. Thanks, convener. Uh, thanks, uh, Jennifer. Um, section two point four of the report, um, Jennifer. Um, I, I may have missed you uh, saying this, but I noticed the languages may roll out um, the the learning uh, modules um, to other um, classes. Is there a reason why the, it's been said that that's that's may roll it out? Surely, if the resources there, it's current. It's only just been developed, um, and it's in a key area of focus for the council, both in a corporate agenda and in education outcomes. Um, then it's important that we do use it. So, what what dialogues taking place between education and families and and yourselves um, to to consider the, the wider benefit of rolling that out um, across the classroom? Jennifer, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Linden. 
Yes, absolutely. The intention would be to roll them out and to make them widely available to any any high schools that want to use them. And I should also say the content of the courses would also be valuable for some of the modern apprentices, both within the council and within our partners, such as Amy and Mears, um, and also young people engaged in the Pathways programme. So no limits whatsoever. We'll happily make them available to, to anyone working with young people who wants to use them. Councillor Butterfly. Thanks, Convener. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Can I, I just ask, it's um, Appendix 1, and it's about the, the sponsor uh, Lanarkshire Business Awards and the COP26 uh, climate change events. Now, I can understand that the 2020 events were cancelled. We're going into 2021, and COP26 is, is going ahead. Um, is, is there a reason why PwC are, are not contracted for to to do any of the, the, the sponsorship? Is there is it their um, availability or can you give us a wee bit more information on that? Especially because the, the business awards and the COP26 has been so important and also uh, given a worldwide audience to North Lanarkshire. Jennifer. Thanks, Councillor Barclay. Yes, um, PwC's contribution last year in terms of the business awards, they were they did in part sponsor the business awards insofar as the programme went at that stage. They attended the uh, Meet the Finalists event and they had intended to offer one-to-one -one business support for the winning companies, but the business awards didn't go ahead before they could then follow through and offer that. Um, I would need to check where we are at with a future business awards event for this year or next year um, and come back to you on, on that, Councillor Barclay. But certainly if we are going ahead with a business awards event, whether it be remotely or whether it be a real event, then PwC are still under the framework agreement with us. So we could certainly ask them around what potential they have to, to support the venture. In terms of the COP26 event, they were due to provide a guest speaker to the event that we were going to hold last May, which was an in-person event. It was going to be held in the theatre and they were going to fly up a guest speaker for that event. That didn't take place. Um, we are now having our own climate change event tomorrow morning. Um, and PwC were not able to sponsor tomorrow's event simply because at that time they were not under contract and um, they weren't delivering call off contracts to us. But again, the, the door is there to go back to them, subject to them being under contract to us and us having events that we think they would be interested in. So we will certainly keep them on the radar, Councillor Barclay. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Councillor Barclay. Councillor Lennon. Thanks very much, Chair. My apologies. I'm seeming to have some technical issues today in relation to the, the broadband width that I'm using at the moment. But it was just in case Jennifer highlighted this and perhaps I'm, I'm kind of touching on something that's already been mentioned. I missed quite a bit of the start of the report, but under 2.41, in 24.2, it was just a quick question in relation to whether or not we're getting routes to work involved in these processes and if there's any opportunity for synergy to, to be in existence within it. I see Jennifer nodding ahead to take that as yes. Yes, absolutely happy to report that Roots to Work are represented on the small officer group that's organising the employability and world of work modules. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, yeah, just regarding the appendix one, um, where they're talking about council staff trained to sustain digital service redesign activity within the NLC post contract, where it discussed how many uh, of the individuals have been trained up in the robotic processes, etc. It, it doesn't seem like there's an awful lot of people being trained up in it, and obviously, um, I don't know what our attrition rates like with regards to staff in those departments. But there is a concern that, you know, if you had a wee flurry of staff leaving, then it could leave us 
wee bit low on the ground with regards to the information that's needed and the skills and expertise. So it's just really to find out what the plans are to train more staff on that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Minnell. Obviously, you'll be aware of Digital Transformers team, you know, who are actively working among staff. But perhaps, Jennifer, if you want to pick up on that point from Councillor Mooney. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Mooney. Yes, the staff who have been trained were trained very much on a one-to-one -one basis with the Agilisys um, programmers who were developing our own robotics at that time. And we put... Um, them through accredited training, which means that moving forward, our own staff will have the skills and the confidence to train colleagues and further staff members through mentoring and work shadowing. But um, it's certainly a point that is well made and that we are aware of the need to ensure that our staff are fully up to date and um, able to implement the new technologies across the Council. Thanks, Jennifer. Katina, you want to add to that? Yeah, really just to um, add some context to what Jennifer was saying. So absolutely, we, we have put our staff through accredited training, but, but um, everything that we're working on is, is new for our, our, our technology staff. So um, the DevOps that you hear is talking about and we have to develop in the, the tools in a different way. So there's a whole host of, of courses and training that our, our staff have been on. But, but we don't have um, big numbers of ICT staff. I, I've made that in the past. It's always been highlighted as a, a, as a risk. But obviously, the staff are really excited about moving into the new world. So we, we, we are we're managing. And, and I mentioned, I think, in, in my previous report as well, you know, that knowledge transfer is all, we also on our list of things that we need to do um, in, in this year, which is why I said it's a very busy year. So. We also have to make time to get the staff trained up exactly for those reasons that we're trying to make sure that we don't have any new single points of failure. Um, and in our, our former world, we, we've got some staff who are very, very skilled on particular things, and, and that is a worry for us. And we, we could have single points of failure, but for the new technologies, then we're working really hard to get as many people trained as possible. But it is all just about a matter of time. Um, obviously, even online training um, takes staff away from actually trying to move forward on things. But absolutely, um, very, very well made that we're, we're aware and we've got plans um, through our, our PRD system to try and get as many staff trained on the new technologies as possible. Yeah, thanks, Katrina. Don't say MDL from chat bar. So if we can agree to the recommendations on page 19. Agenda number four is digital skills and inclusion of Owen. Thank you, Councillor Duffy, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, the report uh, provides an update on the progress and activities that are taking place to drive forward digital skills and inclusion across North Lanarkshire. And undoubtedly, over the last 12 months, the requirement um, for us all to work, live and do business digitally has increased exponentially, and we see that pace of change set to increase. We're also very much aware um, that we do need to move forward with this agenda to avoid digital exclusion and to make sure there's no digital skills gap moving forward. The report also provides a brief update um, on the digital connectivity and infrastructure procurement, um, which is due to go live on PCS this week, and that is going to improve our connectivity across North Lanarkshire in line with the Council's own connectivity. In section Mute there, apologies, I don't know how that happened. Sorry, um, apologies for that. I must have pressed the button on my, my headset. Apologies. So section 1.4 of the report um, highlights um, the multidisciplinary digital skills and inclusion group that was set up in 2019 across the council. And this came on the back, not only of the council's digital IT strategy, but also on the back of the employability review and the resultant workforce for the future strategy, bringing together all those pieces of work, looking at digital skills. So section 1.6 outlines the overall um, objective of the working group which is to deliver develop and deliver digitally confident communities with people and businesses that have the connectivity confidence and skills to use digital services and to build a digital ready workforce across north lanarkshire and that's very much the objective the group's been working to 
So the report provides an overview of the five work streams, which are digital teaching and learning, digital business, digital council, digital communities, and digital health and care. Section 2.1, um, we've reviewed the Scottish Government's new digital strategy, which was released in March 2021. And we've looked at the themes and priorities across that. And we're continuing to make sure that the work of the Digital Skills and Inclusion Group aligns with the work streams that the Scottish Government has in its action plan and strategy. So from section 2.4 onwards, there's an update from each of the work streams. In section 2.4 for digital teaching and learning, this provides a high level overview of the work education and families have undertaken, particularly over the last 12 months, um, to establish the digital school, virtual classrooms, digital curriculums and staff training. And I'd like to highlight in particular section 2.11, which outlines the launch of the 5G immersive classroom at the Muirfield Centre in Cumbernauld, which was delivered in partnership with BT. Moving forward onto digital business, um, I would certainly highlight that you know the last 12 months has meant that businesses have had to rapidly adopt much more digital delivery of their services. And earlier this year, we undertook a digital skills and connectivity survey, which we received 99 responses from businesses to. In terms of the key highlights from that, 48.1% responded that digital skills were critical to the ongoing success of their business, and 35.44% responded that they were important. I think the, the key highlight for me in the report is that 67% of businesses were highlighting that they have a digital skills gap within their organisation and very much we're now looking to dig beneath these figures to work out what can the council and its partners do to support this. I'd also like to highlight section 2.17. Um, on the 30th of April, we launched the Smart Hub at New College Lanarkshire. This was a partnership college, a partnership project with New College Lanarkshire and the University of Strathclyde. And the hub's now going to be home to a state of the art robotic and automation training facility, which is going to provide dedicated space for small to medium sized enterprises, but also importantly, work with local schools to raise awareness and engage pupils with manufacturing and give them a look into the future of what robotics and operations automation is going to look like. In section 2.18 of the report, and apologies, I've just spotted there's two sections, 2.18 um, is looking at some of the funding the council is going to have available to support businesses. We're looking at our own grant scheme, which is going to Enterprise and Growth Committee on Wednesday. And we also have funding through our business gateway service through Digital Boost and Expert Help Services. Section 2.20 outlines the considerable work that's been going on to build a digital workforce of the future within the Council, looking at all the training plans, the Learn NL module and the Leadership Academy that have been created along with apprenticeship opportunities and the work to build the digital workforce. So considerable work has been going on there. Section 2.29 outlines the work of the digital communities work stream. And in section 2.19, we make reference to a sector wide seminar, which is going to take place. And that seminar is now going to be on the 15th of June. And that will enable us to speak to communities and build on the work um, that we're doing to develop digital skills in our communities. In section 2.33, we outline the digital health and care work stream, which is focusing on how the council can support both its residents and its workforce to embrace and adopt digital solutions, particularly about delivery of care within our communities. Jennifer's covered um, community benefits, which are very much aligned in reporting to the Digital Skills and Inclusion Group on a monthly basis. And importantly, in terms of next steps, 2.39 is outlining um, the work we're now going to take forward to deliver the Digital Skills Action Plan. And very much what we're looking at here is looking at where digital skills requirements and shortages are going to be in the short, medium and long term and mapping pathways into digital roles and careers. And very much this is going to feed back into both our education curriculums, but also our training for those who are seeking work and employment. And I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. You've opened this is a, a very positive report and it's quite refreshing to see the level of detail it's incorporated in it. But I would highlight at 2.5, I think recognition should be given to the Scottish Government, especially the Connecting Scotland programme, which has run out in relation to ensuring that all children are digitally excluded, receive a free iPad, tablet or else Chromebook, especially for uh, young people in education. But overall, I think it's an extremely positive report and well done to you and the team. Thank you, Councillor Lennon. Councillor Barclay. 
Thanks, Kavina. Um, just uh, to ask, it's more uh, to do with the, the connectivity side of things. Again, I, I think it's a great report and I think we're moving, really moving in the right direction in so many different ways. But there, unless there's communities have the right level of connectivity, then it doesn't matter how engaged they are digitally, if they can't actually get on to the internet correctly, and the, the, because their connections are so poor, that's where we have a gap. Now, it's we there was a report team, and forgive me, I can't remember exactly when it was, and it was looking at areas where there, there were is, particular issues about connectivity. Has that was that as part of this report um, of looking at specific? I'll, I'll, I'll call it kind of black holes of where the 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 a community may have issues and how we rectify that. Is there part of that or would there something come along in the future to be able to look at those particular areas of um, within North Lanarkshire that actually do not have the same connectivity because, and it can be, there can only be at times out there's an area in my, in my ward, there's only a mile away from the, the, the main town, but because it is rural, it doesn't have the, the, the same connectivity. I'll make myself clear there, sorry. Yep, thank yep. you, Councillor Barclay. Um, in terms of the digital um, connectivity and infrastructure proposal that we're going to market on this week, very much that's what we're looking to address. So the council um, has its own um, digital infrastructure requirements and what we're going to the market to ask for is how do we make sure that um, those additional services get brought on board to tackle areas where there's low digital connectivity, low take up, because we do have areas that are very well served in terms of digital connectivity, but there's low take up due to price, due to accessibility with devices, and also looking at our areas that are rurally excluded. So very much we're asking the market to work with us to see how we can extend that reach in terms of connectivity. On top of that, the Scottish Government is also rolling out the R100 programme, and that should be addressing the majority of areas where we still see poor levels of digital connectivity connectivity across North Lanarkshire and we're looking to dovetail on the back of that to improve that particularly with fibre and gigaband, gigabit um, enabled technology um, moving forward so we're looking to address that Councillor Barclay and certainly with the digital skills and inclusion group what we're looking to make sure on is that those people that do want to take up those services have the skills to do so but very much with the infrastructure bid looking at how do we make sure that people have access and have affordable access as well in those communities um Kavina, can i just have a supplementary on that sorry um, that, that's brilliant yvonne and thank you for that is it going to be a, the the is the the digital skills and inclusion group is will they be proactive and going out to look for people and look for those communities or is it going to rely on people coming to us um, as either councillors as a council to see I've got an issue? Probably very much a bit of both. And I know that um, through the, the Digital NL programme, there's been work going out to all the community boards. And I think that'll be a key driver moving forward is using those community boards as a sounding board for those communities to come forward. Certainly with the, the digital um, communities work stream within um, the digital skills and inclusion group we've got staff um, from community learning and development heavily involved in that and staff from the libraries so very much there at the cold face working with communities and you know we're very much keen to hear from those community boards so i know a lot of work's been done on that just now and we're taking those results into interview just now and i also mentioned the event that's taking place on the 15th of june and very much that's a communities event that people can come along to so we're hoping to see a good uptake on that and also working closely with our partners van l and others on that so it is very much a, a partnership moving forward thanks everyone Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, page 35, item 2.8, Digital Classroom. I know that, that um, all schools don't offer all subjects and people need to travel to different schools for certain subjects. Um, do we know yet if this uh, virtual learning environment is likely to to um, have an impact on the amount of travel that pupils need to do um, their whole range of subjects? 
Um, thank you, Councillor Hume. I'll certainly need to come back on that, but my understanding is that by virtual delivery, that would reduce the amount of travel between schools by doing it in classrooms, but I will revert back to colleagues in education to come back fully on that. That's fine, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, don't see any, anybody else in the chat bar if we can agree to the recommendations. Sorry, Councillor Mooney. Thanks very much, um, Convener. Sorry for the late question. It's just on the back of what um, Councillor Hume, uh, Hume was just saying there. Um, one of my children, who's just about to move into six year, has recently had his options brought home. And I didn't see any digital offerings there. It was very much only in his school. So I'm a bit concerned that maybe all schools aren't offering this out to their, their pupils, especially in the kind of upper years and fifth and sixth year. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Councillor Mooney. Obviously, we'll take the comments on and we'll pick it up after the committee. Page 31 contains recommendations for this item, if we can agree to them. Agenda item number five is the digital aerial communication engagement activity, and Linda's going to take us through this. Thanks, convener. Afternoon, members. So, you'll be familiar with this report. We bring an update on the communications and engagement activity to all transformation and digitisation committees. And this report is now focusing on the, the work that's involved in moving us uh, through the communication journey from our design and into the actual build and go live. So you'll see from section two of the report, the last couple of reports have focused very firmly on the rollout of Microsoft Office 365 to all of our employees. And that programme will be coming to an end uh, by the, the summer. Um, from this point, again, we've focused very, very heavily on the engagement to get buy-in and encourage all employees to take part in the, the small bite-sized training and also the targeted training that, that's ongoing just now. Uh, there's another session of that tomorrow, and that's identified at section 2.5 of the report. Earlier on, you heard mention of our digital transformers, and it's now where we need to re um rebrand and refresh the work that our digital transformers have been carrying out for us over the, the course of the, the rollout of our digital program. You'll recall that the um implementation of the digital transformers was to be floor walkers in their establishments to help support uh, colleagues and so on as part of the, the rollout. And that hasn't been able to take place due to the COVID and also the fact that staff are now working from home. So a whole new programme uh, needs to be developed for our digital champions as they will be as we move forward into the, the business as usual, if you like, following the, the completion of the migration programme. There, there will be a, a full report uh, at the SRO meeting and the, the delivery board over the, the coming weeks and a further update in the next report to Digi uh, Transformation and Digitisation Committee in the next cycle to make you aware of, of the, the key tasks and the key asks for our digital champions. From the last meeting, the introduction of new online services continues. Uh, one of the, the key um, targets that was set by the Head of Strategic Communications was to increase the My Account registrations, and you'll see the figures contained within the document um, as to where we got to before the end of March. We continue to promote the switching to self-service options um, for, for all of our residents and uh, users of our services. You'll also note at section 2.15 that uh, there was a pilot um, to look into the technical officers using digital equipment to inspect uh, calls and instead of calls to people's houses. You'll see within the report that there was a mention that um, the, the, the testing of this for the pilot would be put on hold, but in actual fact, the service moved swiftly through with the testing phase and has declared the pilot successful, um, so much so that this will now be used as the first point of contact for all of that type of work. And the uh, housing service are now looking at other uh, opportunities within their service and also within financial inclusion services, whereby this technology would be beneficial. 
You'll also see that at section 2.18, our residents can now book a van into the recycling centre, cutting down on the number of calls to the customer services hub. And again, this is a recently uh, introduced service, but it's been well received and well used since implementation. And then at section 2.19, you'll see that uh, the intention is to install damp meters across 50 properties as part of a pilot programme during this month. The letters to those tenants and so on have gone out and we again will update committee uh, in the next cycle. As far as the trade unions are concerned, we did mention this earlier on, but you'll see at 2.21 that we continue with the recently implemented six weekly meetings, one held on the 30th of March and one on the 29th of April. And again, that's where Katrina and Lorraine outlined to the, the trade unions around the, the, the update on the sprints and the year three programme that was submitted to committee today. Finally, is driving digital locally, again mentioned in the Vaughan report. Um, we had very successful events at the community board, attended all nine community boards. And the ask was that we would look for representatives of those community boards to set up a digital subgroup. And we have received representatives from each of the areas who are keen to work with us to move forward our digital programme across North Lanarkshire. And again, that will be progressed and updated as part of these reports to committee. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to outline the, the youth engagement, because again, mentioned in the last cycle that this was an area where all our planned activities have been severely impacted by COVID. But I'm pleased to um, highlight to members that a number of engagement uh, activities have taken place last meeting around the, the engagement with hubs, active schools coordinators and engagement with our youth groups through community learning and development colleagues. And again, as I say, we'll bring a full report on driving digital locally in the next cycle. You'll then see that there's three areas that we need to target uh, to, prior to the next committee. And I would just ask that members support uh, th those recommendations for next steps. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Linda. Councillor Lennon. Chair, thank you. I hope you can indulge me a wee bit here, Chair, because I might stray off point just a tad, but you can keep me back on it if that's okay. Under introduction of new online services at 2.15, it talks about the pilot that took place in Bells Hill and View Park. I'm interested because there's a common theme appearing here in relation to digital connectivity across the authority, especially in the rural areas and stuff like that. But how many people were digitally excluded for this process? Uh, again, is there an overarching number here? Do we have a sort of map in relation to the overall authority of those who have digital access and those that don't? Because if the council is aligning for services to become more digitally uh, focused, then I think that we have to have a good understanding of those, and especially in the same rural communities and various other areas who are digitally excluded or digitally disengaged. And only the point that might be straying off tangent a wee bit, I seem to recall, and no politicising at all under any circumstance, the key point being in the last general election when your previous leader, the UK Labour Party, when they were talking about a national broadband service, has any consideration ever been given to a local authority broadband service to ensure that that digital divide can somehow be bridged and gapped? Because really, in effect, it would be a good idea at this point. Thanks, Councillor Lennon. Linda, you're in a position, I don't know if I want to bring Katrina in as well on a couple of these points. Yeah, Councillor Duffy, that would be, be helpful. Um, I don't have uh, digitally excluded figures uh, as far as the clients. We do have joined up approaches to um, digital exclusion across the authority, and Yvonne mentioned some of that as part of the connectivity. But I'm happy to hand over to Katrina if she wants to come in and, and provide some further context around that. Thanks, Linda. Katrina? Yeah, thank you. No, digital exclusion is, is, is a major worry for us. We've all always said that as a council, we're moving forward on a digital first basis, but absolutely not um, only digital. We look, we, we're looking for self-service, but recognise that not, not everyone um, can do so. As you say, um, people can't get access to kits sometimes. So this has certainly been identified a, as, a, as an issue across all of the community boards when we were doing our, our consultation around digital earlier in the year. 
um, and, and we're trying to take forward, as and it was mentioned in the Holland report, um, of, of get, actually getting a digital skills action plan. So certainly through Connecting Scotland and the work that happened earlier on in last year um, with our education people and their social work colleagues, then uh, through their networks, they were certainly trying to identify anyone who didn't have a device or a connectivity. Um, and as well as the information we saw earlier on um, devices being issued to children, there were also um, through the no one left behind um, devices issued to, to um, communities as well. Um, we can absolutely get those numbers, but that, to me, that still won't give us that full picture of digitally excluded because it will have been certain groups of vulnerable people that were probably targeted, whereas we're actually trying to get much more information um, across our communities. So we're certainly wanting to take that forward through all of the networks that we're building up. And it is a slow process, but all the connections are certainly getting made. Um, we, we certainly want to do it through driving digital locally. Um, and, and hoping to start getting that information out there to our communities. Um, and, and one of our next steps is that um, in seminar um, session that Yvonne mentioned in the middle of June. Um, the key focus there is about digital exclusion and starting to try and get a better handle on what it actually is for, for the council so that we, we can help to address it. Um, again, through the, 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 the driving digital local, driving digital, sorry, I can't even speak now, digital North Lanarkshire is what I'm trying to say, the community organisation, you know, we're, we're trying to work with them and they've got some um, interactions in the communities just now, but it's really just developing it as much as possible so that we've got that rich source of data that we can actually start to think about what those solutions need to be. On the National Broadband Service, um, haven't given any consideration to that as such, but again, Yvonne, Yvonne mentioned in response to Councillor Barclay that that's what our tender that we're putting out this week seeks to do. Um, we, we are seeking to make sure that we've got connectivity across all of the council area um, so that people can actually access something affordable. Obviously, we've got a range of outcomes in that tender that we're asking bidders to comment on. Um, and we'll be able to report back on what that looks like and maybe start to be able to see some things getting addressed um, and possibly not next cycle, but certainly the cycle thereafter by the time we work our way through the procurement process. So, so hopefully that provides um, some context, Councillor. Thank you very much, Katie. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Cameron. Uh, yeah, thank you, Convener. It's just a really quick follow up to the Councillor. Lennon's uh, question on the, the the national broadband thing and the possibility of the council bringing it in. Um, it was just I don't. It was to either make ourselves aware or uh, the the or officers aware uh, that I know the legislation was passed at a UK level uh, several years ago to make it possible to do it, and that there is already at least I believe in England and Wales parish councils that have started implementing. Uh, Local broadband networks. I've never, I've not actually heard of anything at a council level in Scotland. I believe there's some community groups that have started looking at it, but uh, it, it is the it is available. Uh, so it's, it's if it's something the officers want to have a look at or not. Thanks, Councillor Cameron. Don't see anybody else on the chat bar, so if we can read the recommendations on page forty-three. Agenda item number six is the ICT service delivery options. And Grant is going to take us through this report. Yeah, thank you. Afternoon, all. Uh, so, hopefully, this is a, an interesting wee paper on ICT service delivery considerations. Uh, 1 1 through 1 6 provides a background on our current contract with Wipro, the current partner, with 1 2 stating that we are in the last year of the current extension period with an option for a further two years to, uh, to extend uh, from the 1st of April 22. 17 through to 115 discusses what's changed since the current contract was approved. And as you can see, there's you know quite substantial changes over the last couple of years, you know, COVID notwithstanding, and there's been a, a lot of impact on what how we deliver services and what the council's after. 25 to 219 discusses what's required in a, an ICT service delivery, uh, how it's managed and, and how it's delivered. And I apologize for some of the, the technical jargon that we've got in there, but we felt we had to kind of share it. 2.7 uh, provides a, a technical towers view uh, for areas currently in scope. And as you can see uh, through the text there, there's, there's areas with significant overlap. 
And these demonstrate multiple touch points in service delivery, and hence there is opportunities there to maybe do things slightly differently and maybe do them more efficiently. 210 uh, shows how these technical towers uh, reflect uh, the maps to uh, the resource distribution uh, of staffing. And then from 220 to 224, we discuss options uh, that we feel were available with 226 to 231 providing uh, an assessment of these options, referencing the SWOT and risk analysis within the appendix, and 62, uh, where we set out how that translates into option scoring. And then finally, within 231, recommending that we proceed uh, with negotiations on option three, that's uh, right sourcing with the remaining uh, two years available to us through the contract with Wipro, whilst recognising that we need to plan for option two, uh, which is insourcing, uh, should negotiations in that area uh, be unsuccessful. And that was a brief summary. Thanks, Grant. Councillor Hume first. Thanks, Chair. Um, a bit of uncertainty and concern about this, um, which prompts me to raise the question. Um, when I see uh, some of the terminology used in a committee report about the current provider um, operated somewhat successfully um, and reached SLA levels for the most part, um, it, it's, it's not an enthusiastic um, uh, Comment on why pro service. So that, that, that's that's um, and I don't know if that's completely due to COVID or not. It doesn't say in the report. But the, the the major the major aspect of my concern is that the the two options that we're asked to approve are mutually exclusive. Um, and already I've got concerns about option two to bring it in house. Um, why pro needs six months notice to to terminate the contract. So that leaves us less than six months to divide to decide whether bringing it in house is a viable option, and I I think I think that's um, a, a very concerning timescale. Uh, so uh, my, my concerns about that, and if why pro the, the suggestion is that they weren't they weren't. Um, Completely successful providers in the, in, in, in the current contract, um, and they they they, they they however they want to keep NLC as a reference site, but the suggestion is if we engage them again, they're not making enough money and they want more money. So you know, no, all of these questions are going around in my head and they, they haven't been clarified within the report. But again, I guess the the mutual exclusivity of the the two options and. Uh, Less than six months to decide if we're going option for option two is the main concern I have. Grant, do you want to take up any of the points from Crystal Hume? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the in terms of option two, we feel that it's prudent to continue uh, looking at option two as a, a, a fallback in case those negotiations uh, with uh, Wipro and option three are not concluded satisfactorily. And, and what we mean by that is that if we change the scope of the uh, the contract such, because we believe that a number of the things now should probably be insourced back in when you see the way that it's, it's laid out, that in doing so, we may make the, the overall contract unattractive to Wipro, and they may say, we do not want to take on the further two-year extension. So that's why we feel we have to continue uh, exploring that second option uh, uh, so that we understand exactly where we stand with it in terms of 2P and such like, uh, should that need to be the case. Uh, I think there's always a need uh, for organisations like ourselves to be able to access resources from, you know, big organisations like Sawai Pro, uh, where they not only have that global brand and that global experience to deliver on those services, but they have a, a resource pool that's available to us that we can hopefully call on. Uh, in terms of the performance uh, of Wipro, I, I think uh, if, if it's coming across as, as being overly negative, then that that's that would be uh, incorrect of us if that's how it's been put there. I think they've, they've done exceedingly well, particularly over the last year. Uh, as everybody has done, to try and deliver services in completely changing uh, uh, times. And what we're really doing here is to try to say that when that contract was first put out uh, and then when it was reassessed, uh, 
things have just markedly changed uh, in what the, how the council is structured and what it needs to move forward. And that's going to be challenging for somebody like Whitbro. There is no doubt that they feel that they haven't uh, perhaps uh, been as successful uh, as selling as additional services through the contract as they would like. And all you know, contracts come with that. The service provider of every contract always looks to sell you on additional services. So from their point, they haven't felt that that's really delivered in, in that area. And from our point, we would also say that we don't feel it's delivered in that area either quite successfully. Uh, but there has been massive change. And we just feel that the contract itself is is not set out of way to default. The easy thing to do here would be to default to option one and extend it for two years under the existing terms. And we generally don't think that's the right thing. We don't think it's, it's fit for what the council now needs. Option four, going back out completely to the market, we just assess as being completely unachievable in the timelines that, that, that sit there. And then that leaves us with those other two options and in many regards, in sourcing it back in, should we start planning for that now as achievable, although it will be challenging with everything else that sits on the table. Uh, and that's why we believe that right sourcing it through option three with them is the right thing, but we need to continue to plan for, for option two should that negotiation fail. Hopefully that gives a wee bit more clarity in, uh, in the tone of the paper. Thanks, Grant. Katrina's wanting to add to that, I think, or maybe contextualise something. Yeah, just a little bit more context. So, um, and Grant's picked up on that. Um, the Wipro have actually been very, very successful with their, their performance um, up until COVID. So it absolutely is a result of, of the change um, for them and us. Um, you'll remember, Councillor Hume, that we brought our performance information to committee last year and the Wipro stats were included within that. Um, and, and we've got a very high SLA for Wipro, it's 95%. So, so they have been failing on that and the report does highlight that we were working with them to address that and agreed to reduce that. So in reducing it, that they are now managing to meet that. Um, and that was only a fair thing to do. So, so they have genuinely over the period that we've had them as a partner worked very well, but we do have to acknowledge that it was meant to be under different circumstances. And then really just picking up on option two and the, the six months. So then the six months notice is required to make sure that there's time to actually work through all the detail that's in the exit plan. So like Grant, um, if we found that um, Wipro, um, the right sourcing wasn't working for them, um, and we've been in dialogue with them as part of producing this report. So there are conversations already underway. And what we're looking for today is just to get agreement that, that we do drop one and four and put our efforts into it, A, trying to get right sourcing. And if that's not um, as attractive to them, then that we do invoke that six months um, notice so that we've got time to work through the exit plan and do the, the insourcing um, um, for April. So ho hopefully that gives a little bit of context. Councillor Hume, do you want back in, or are you? No, no. Just that that that, that covers my questions. It, it certainly didn't make clear that uh, item three was the preferred option uh, within the report, as far as I could see. Uh, so yeah, we we wait, we wait expectantly with the result of the discussions with Ypro. Then, thanks, Councillor. Councillor Linden. Um, thanks, Convener. I, I wanted to echo some of what Councillor Hume said. Actually, in terms of language. Um, and I appreciate the intention may not have been to um, have painted it uh, in quite uh, how it's been read, but I, I mean, I, you know, a couple of choice quotes that I had pointed out, uh, you know, substantial change to the operational needs of the council, increase in service desk volumes, again, the, the kind of repeated emphasis on changes to operational practice, um, and I think at one section um, it says delivered few of the additional values targeted by both parties. Um, so I think that you know, Councillor Hume can be forgiven for some of the language that's been deployed um, in in. The, in the report. Uh, more relaxed about the recommendation, I can be you know, to be honest, I think that if the assessment's been done, then, then that's the right thing to do. My question really is how in pursuing um, recommendation uh, three um, and indeed recommendation two, if needs be, how are we going to make sure that we realise um, that the contract does what it needs to moving forward, um, in particular, um, ensuring that it helps respond to that change in operational practice um, and anticipate perhaps some of the change in practices of the council um, in, within the contract. So I'm thinking in particular about the emphasis on home working um, and how we can ensure the contract uh, is fit and responds to those uh, particular needs as well. Um, so just some reassurance on that, uh, convener would be, would be welcome. Thank you, Grant. 
So one of the main drivers that we're, we're thinking about here is, is you know, this delivering for communities uh, across the authority and how we should be establishing that. Uh, and when you look at that centralised service through uh, an individual third party doing some core components, but only for certain aspects of the council, that's where it starts to ha ha have problems in, in terms of, you know, uh, potentially with a, a community based building, you could end up with a Wipro employee going in to do a task depending upon who you worked for and where you sat in that building. But you could have somebody from the council, somebody from NL Leisure, as it was previously, or somebody from education families coming in to do the exact same task. If you're in the same building working for a different service, but in a slightly different place, that isn't really very efficient. Uh, and, and so what we're trying to do is to take that model and then expand it out into the wider communities that we have there and look at those community hubs and see, well, how do we service that whole local community as best that we can? And be doing that, we hope that that also fits into uh, some of the home working, certainly for people who live within North Lanarkshire and having access to those local community hubs. That's where the staff, you know, would then be based for them to be able either to come in and, and uh, you know have a, a, a flexi desk uh, available to them, or if they're coming in looking for help, looking for support on a, a, a problem, a difficulty with the machine or whatever, that that availability is there locally within those communities. The in terms of the service desk numbers, you know what we've saw is something like uh, at least a, a, a thousand calls a month more coming into the service desk uh, over that whole COVID period. Now, not not to be, uh, uh, I think probably very expected when you all of a sudden push lots of people out at home who were used to working in the office in particular ways. Ultimately, although Wipro don't fix all of those faults, they they manage the service desk, so everything hits them first. It has to go through them, and that's caused massive amounts of problems. And just in terms of the the the, the service desk there itself, and to the extent that we actually had to fund additional service desk resources in there, uh, they also put uh, forward some funding for additional resources in there as well. So we worked in partnership to try and deliver that. We are seeing those numbers coming down, and we've been trying to uh, launch across uh, uh, the, the council. You maybe saw it uh, over, over the last couple of weeks. We were, we're saying to people we're looking to remove telephones, as, or not so much remove the, the telephone call to the service desk, but looking to discourage it as much as possible, looking to remove email interaction and try and make people self serve via the customer portal so that they can actually gain access quicker and easier to resources rather than backing up onto a, a large service desk area. So, you know, as we continue to develop the model and work with education and families and the insourcing of the NLL and culture NL people into the organisation, we'll look to build that around about the communities and very much try and build that model out for how we're going to support uh, both our staff and the communities moving forward in one joined up manner rather than, you know, fragmented approaches depending upon what service uh, you're aligned with. Thanks, Grant. Councillor Landon, are you supplementary? Are you okay? Thanks, Kavita. Thanks. Councillor Cameron. Uh, yeah, I was looking for a bit of clarification, actually, in option one. I was looking to find out if that was a, in the contract, was a fixed two year extension or if it was an up to two year extension, as I've seen in other contracts, because if it was an up to two year extension, I wouldn't. I would suggest that it might be worth looking at having the taking part of that to give us the opportunity to look at op to 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 explore options two and four with that further time period. Because if I'm right, the the officer said earlier we don't have enough time to look at op to to properly implement option four, which would be to put out retender with the new realities of what we need. And if that's an up to extension, we could extend for a say a year to give us that opportunity to fully retender. So I was looking to find out if it was in the contract that it was a fixed two year period if we extend, or if it was an up to two year period that we can extend to. Grant, I would need to check the wording to be exactly right, but I'm almost a hundred percent sure it is a it's a fixed three plus two plus two, uh, so it's not. Although it is up to seven in total, I think once you commit to that additional two-year extension, it is expected to be a full two-year. But I'd, I'd just like to go back and and check. It's a few oh, years yeah. since I've, I've probably read it. Katrina, 
Um, Pretty certain it is fixed the way we looked at the language of that when we brought the, the, the proposal for the two year extension um, um, just back in 2019. So, um, yeah, there is no scope for it to just be a one year. It, it is fixed for two years. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Cannon. Councillor Minnie. some technical issues of in the surgery today so I'm trying to work off my phone. Um, I just want to go back to some numbers that were mentioned um, a few moments ago where there was an extra thousand calls coming in per month. Now, that works out about 30 calls extra per day thereabouts which is probably about an extra four or five calls an hour. Now most resources should be able to handle that which suggests to me that we either get a resourcing problem ongoing or there's maybe a, a problem with them delivering the SLEs in general. So I, I think really we should consider that moving forward. You know, our doctor surgery had an increase in calls during the pandemic, but we handled those calls due to increased in resourcing, yes. But you know, certainly we, we, we'd have had about an extra thousand calls. Um, so I, I just think there might be an underlying problem why they weren't able to handle, you know, an extra four or five calls per hour extra. Um, that, that does give me a wee bit of concern, having you know, worked in certainly in call centre environments for a great many years, and certainly in technical support. If the resource is right, they should have been able to handle that level of calls. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Murray. Katina. Yeah, so for the money that we're paying, then we, we have a, a, a slim um, set of resources from Wipro, and we can flex up and down, and Grant mentioned already, that we both did so. Both organisations acknowledged that we weren't able to manage the calls, but the call durations were significantly extended as well. Um, so it wasn't just the numbers, um, which, which then meant that you needed more resources available to be able to get through the calls because um, people are, were naturally frustrated trying to work from home with all the different problems they were experiencing and, and, and wanting to talk through um, how to resolve that. So, so I, I don't think it would be fair to say that they weren't resourced properly because they'd worked with us for many years um, and had delivered on those 95% SLAs. Um, this is a particular set of situation circumstances that they have worked with us to, to resolve. Thanks, Katrina. Don't see anybody else in the chat bar. If we can agree to the recommendations on page 50 of your papers. The last item is agenda number seven, which is your contracts awarded by the committee approval threshold. Does anybody have any questions or comments in regards to this? If not, can we agree to recommendations on page 73? Thank you very much. I would have a nice day. Thanks, Convener.